This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability and a generous investment by Julianne Wrigley. Part of this is that for sustainability, we have always been looking forward. But at the same time, for innovation, we have been looking backward. We have been looking what the result of it is. We need to complement, in each case, that particular perspective with its obverse. We need to start looking in a backcasting way on sustainability. We need to decide socially what kind of future do we want, and then sort of start saying, well, how do we get there? At the same time, we need to start looking at innovation from the perspective of if the, once there was nothing, now we're creating something. So my conclusion here is that we need to move to what is what I would call adaptive design. What we do in most cases is we design things for stability. And we should be designing things for change. And I know there's at least one architect in the room who I will not call, who is, I think, sensitive to these things. But I recently gave a, a lecture to a whole collection of architects here in the valley. And I think that became a really interesting point of discussion. So we, in that context, we don't only need to learn from the past, as I said, but we need to learn for the future. What is the difference? Well, for our relation with the past, we can construct causative narratives. For the future, we can't. So we have to start thinking a different way, no longer linearly, but in terms of alternatives. And that is, I think, something that we need to stimulate in our children. What we do is they come to class very early, and the teacher has two options, either to socialize the students or to stimulate their creativity. It's a lot easier to socialize them. How do are they socialized? By telling them stories that everybody shares. That basically, I think, at least reduces their native and, and in, inherent capacity to think in terms of alternatives and to start at every moment thinking, well, what else could have happened? I think that is an educational problem that we're beginning to deal with in our new program on sustainability science for teachers. Because Lee Hartwell and I sort of hit it off on that one. So that is that much. I'm getting quite close. Um, I don't know how far we are. Oh, we're not that bad, actually. I have one more minute. That's OK. I, I'll probably use about four or five, but nevertheless. So. The question then becomes, if you start saying, OK, we have to design a future, which, as Michael Crow always says, is the easiest way to control that future, is whether that is really true from this perspective. And I would argue that it isn't really. Because even if you design, there will always be these unintended consequences. And you cannot make that design last forever. And then I come to a phrase, the planner's fallacy that I took from Kahneman, who is the Nobel Prize winner in cognitive science, and who basically pointed out that most planners overrate the time over which their plan will actually be relevant, active, doable, and so on and so forth. So we need to start thinking very, very differently about what we design. We need to design resilient systems. And then finally, we have the information revolution. And there I'm going to be really, really short and go immediately to the next thing. One of the things is we need to fuse what information technology does and what we do in our own lives. It's very interesting to talk to these information people. They all think that the information society is a new thing. Well, I would argue that it was there since the Paleolithic, but that we simply get a new technology to enhance it, and that's a very important one, and one that may help us get out of the problems where we are, but nevertheless, I think uh, that is not a new thing in that sense. So uh, here are some suggestions about things that I think that can be done. And we're working in a project in Europe to realize, in particular, some of those first three things in using information technology to get to people in a different way. And we need to, as I said, spread computational thinking in society and generalize the information processing thinking in computer science. That is a difficult uh, boundary that we need to conquer and that we need to get over. The other thing that information technology can do is the massive data evolution 
can undermine something that has made us very past dependent in our thinking. And it is the fact that our theories are always heavily underdetermined by our observations, simply because we can't observe enough instances to get a sense that we can actually sort out on a real basis rather than intuitively what our theories actually should be, how we should explain many phenomena. So big data helps there. Another thing, I think, is trying to overcome the limitations of this short-term working memory. That entails, in particular, that we start using our computers in a very different way. We should start using our computers not in the way we have traditionally done, but to actually learn for the future. That is, we should use computers to enhance the number of dimensions that are implicated in any particular problem, rather than reduce them so that we can understand them in our own minds. There's a very interesting uh, attempt at that. It's going on currently at Harvard in the medical domain that at a colloquium that George and Anna and I organized last June came out where a man called Walter Fontana is creating a system where on the basis of a set of data, he creates the thousands of potential hypotheses that can actually link those data and then goes the next step and looks at which ones are the more probable, which is, I think, a really interesting way to go that way. Okay. Uh, there's, after this, is only one more slide, okay? So, complex systems, we have said, are unpredictable in the long term. We need to start looking at feed forward and feed back together. We need to come up with a relational logic that actually does that, and one person who is working on that in Europe is a man called Belknap, who I can give you the citation for. And then finally, we need to look at, and that is a really important task that as complex systems people here in the university we feel we should propagate, is basically look at decision making under uncertainty in a different way. And look at it as a complex system by itself with all the actors involved. And one of the things that I found in Europe that we all look for this decision maker, right? Who is the person we aim our model at. Well, in most cases it doesn't exist because most decisions are made by default simply because nobody thinks about anything else. And that's a really interesting lesson. And when you start looking at decision making on a more uh, sort of systematic basis, you come up with a number of things like that. So another part of that is more forecasting, more futuring, more scenarios. We have a huge need for more scenarios, and in particular, making scenarios right now is in the hands of industry or government. And there's very little that goes on in academia. And so there's very little that is on forecasting, and that is actually has the, the sort of critical aspect of what academic, dis academic disciplines are all about. And I would argue that we need more of that. And then finally, we need to evaluate the things that we choose against the things that we haven't chosen. Now. This presentation is brought to you by Arizona State University's Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability for educational and non-commercial use only.